so I'd like folks to raise their hands if they've ever heard anyone say this. If there were more qualified white people out there, we'd love to hire them. Anybody? All right. Uh, how about this one? If there, we would hire more men as long as we don't have to lower the bar. Anybody? No. So now I'd like folks to raise their hands if they've ever heard one of those sentences uttered about women or people of color. So the result of this is that essentially what we're saying is that the quality of white and male talent, that, the quality of that talent pool is assumed. But the quality of the female or non-binary or person of color talent pool has to be proven. And what that means is that people assume that we're not actually here, and that as a result of that, we're often not included. And this has enormous economic and social implications and consequences. And that's the reason why we started Code 2040. But before we get there, um, I'll tell you a little bit about how we ended up there um, starting this movement for Hidden Figures. So I grew up in New York City. Um, I am biracial. Um, and actually, I recently realized that at the point when my parents got married, um, only 1% of all marriages were interracial, um, right after Loving v. Virginia. Um, I grew up in Morningside Heights, a really diverse neighborhood in Manhattan. Uh, I went to public magnet schools, super diverse. Uh, went to college on the East Coast, worked on the East Coast, and had always been surrounded by this diversity without really thinking twice about it. And then I decided to go to grad school. Um, I knew I wanted to go back into the nonprofit sector, and I felt like some uh, business fundamentals would help me out. So I went out to Stanford, and when I moved there, I found myself in the middle of Palo Alto, um, in the middle of Silicon Valley, something that I'd only sort of heard about previously. Um, this was 2007. Facebook was only a few years old. Twitter was brand new. Um, and I was really shocked by this entrepreneurial spirit and um, kind of everything that was happening around me. Um, I felt like I was in the middle of something, and when a friend of a friend offered me an opportunity to join his startup, um, I took it. Uh, and I started moving in all these different rooms, going to meetups and speaking on panels, and I was constantly struck by how innovative and creative the space was, but also how homogenous it was. And the data bore out this feeling. Um, so the narrative at the time was tech is a meritocracy, the people who are here deserve to be here, and the people who are not here don't deserve to be here. It's, if you're not here, it's a lack of talent. Um, and there was this deep doubt about the quality of the other. Um, and I started to hear a lot of those phrases at the beginning, although not about white men. And that ring falls to me, too. Um, I had grown up and spent most of my education surrounded by really diverse, very qualified groups. And again, the data backed me up when I dug in, particularly looking at technical talent, about 18% of computer science degrees go to black and Latino talent, and yet the industry numbers are more like 5%. It turns out that I wasn't having these thoughts alone, so I teamed up with a friend of mine from business school, Tristan Walker, who had been working at Twitter and Foursquare, and he'd been hearing those exact same excuses. So we decided to do something about it. We figured if there was talent out there and there was opportunity out there, um, and those weren't finding each other, then that was basically a market failure. So what we decided to do was create a market maker. So we launched Code 2040, and we started with uh, our flagship program, the Fellows Program. So the Fellows Program was pretty small at the start. Um, we started with five students, uh, but I'll give you a little snapshot of what it looks like today, or almost today, since uh, we're having our sixth cohort this summer in 2017. Um, we have students come out from around the country. We set them up with internships at our partner tech companies. It's their first ever job or internship for about two-thirds of the students. And we run what's basically a career accelerator on the evenings and weekends. Uh, we do workshops, they get mentors, we do networking, peer support. 
Um, we work with about 40 to 50 companies, and what the companies get is access to a new talent pool they haven't been accessing, um, the ability to host a certain number of interns, and then also some coaching and training from us, and the recognition that they're actually doing something about this challenge, which in turn attracts more talent. Um, and I should mention that they pay to participate in the program. So through running the fellows program, we realized that it wasn't just this bridge in the middle, this sort of market making um, that was required, but actually there was some work to be done on both the supply or student side and the demand or company side. Um, so starting with the student side, um, my team did some really deep research on what is it that's happening that is causing this breakdown in the transition from education to employment on the student side. Um, and realized that there were four main barriers. So social isolation, um, students who didn't have peers that looked like them or they identified with in the major, and then the folks they were hanging out with um, evenings and weekends were also not in their major, um, so they felt really isolated. Lack of access to mentorship, lack of exposure to the industry, not understanding what was waiting for them on the other side, um, and lack of previous tech experience. And I'll just say on this one, um, what was interesting is that it wasn't necessarily that they needed more experience in order to do well academically or even in the industry, but that a lack of experience often led to a lack of confidence, which then created a whole host of other issues as they navigated the space. It turns out, though, uh, while the problem was largely being portrayed as a supply side problem, that there were actually a lot of issues on the demand side or the company side as well. Um, so companies were saying the talent's not out there, but actually there are a number of ways that they were getting in their own way. Um, and these are a few of them. They didn't have access to the diverse networks that they were trying to recruit from because those weren't the folks that were in their doors already. Um, they uh, actually had assessments for talent that were disproportionately weeding out talent of color and talent from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, their culture was often formed around a tight-knit friend group that maybe all came from the same schools or the same hometowns or the same socioeconomic class, the same racial backgrounds. Um, and it created a culture that was often unintentionally exclusive where folks didn't feel like they belonged if they were from a different background. And the final thing is there are actually skills around managing a diverse workforce that companies didn't have and didn't realize that there were new competencies that they needed to learn. So we do all of those things, working with the students, working with the companies, and building those bridges to work on the existing system that's out there. Um, but a couple of years ago, when I would welcome the fellows every summer, I started asking this question when I spoke to them um, to gauge their interest in entrepreneurship. Um, how many of you think that you might want to start a tech company one day? Um, and it turned out that it was a pretty big number. Um, it was about 80% of our students. And it turned out, too, that in addition to these breakdowns in the existing company ecosystem, there were also challenges in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. But it helped us start to ask this question of, what if instead of just working on retrofitting existing companies, we could actually help founders build equitable companies from the bottom up? And what if those founders were black and Latinx themselves? So around that time, we got a phone call from Google. Um, and Google works with this network of partner tech hubs around the country. And they had expressed an interest in becoming more inclusive. And so we co-designed this program called the Code 2040 Residency with Google for Entrepreneurs with three goals. One is to support black and Latinx tech entrepreneurs directly. Two is to support the tech hubs in each of these locations to become more diverse and inclusive, inclusive themselves. And three was to generate the learnings that we would need about the challenges, the system breaks, and the opportunities so that we could create solutions at scale. And the same way we thought about the fellows program as giving us all this insight into the ecosystem that exists, we think about the residency as giving us insight into the ecosystems that are being built. And then, as I did all of this work, traveled around, my team went out and was digging in, 
we constantly heard um, one thing over and over again, which was that people wanted a code 2040 for X. So a code 2040 for media, or a code 2040 for finance, or a code 2040 in my city or town, or a code 2040 in this other country. And what we realized was that the work that we were doing with Code 2040 would change lives and was changing lives already. But the way that it was set up, it wouldn't necessarily change systems. And around the same time, we started getting these stories back from our first alums. So one of the alums of that first pilot fellows program with only five students had gone on to graduate he started his own tech company, raised a round of funding, and then a couple years in, actually hired another one of our alums. And we started to see the power of the community and realized that we needed to use our programs to not just impact individuals, but to activate them. To activate them to build and grow and nurture the community. And so that's the journey of building Code 2040 in this new iteration of the organization that we're embarking on right now. And this is important because we realize that for us, the tech sector is a means to the change that we want to create, not the end goal in and of itself. So as we went through our strategic plan to look ahead three years, to look ahead to the year 2040 at what we really wanted to accomplish, we realized we needed to answer this question of, is tech the means or the end? Do we work with communities of color in order to diversify tech? Or do we work with tech in order to impact communities of color? And both are really valid. Um, tech platforms increasingly set the rules of engagement for how information flows, um, how decisions are made, um, and how we interact with each other as a community and as a society. And creating more diverse voices in those decisions and those products and platforms, I think is actually fundamental to the functioning of our democracy. But where we landed as an organization is that for us, the point of the work that we do is to create economic empowerment. And the other stuff is a really amazing byproduct. And that is driven in part by this statistic, which is that the median household income of a black family and a Latino family combined is just about the starting salary of a person going into the tech industry. So I remember one summer when there was a group of our summer interns, our fellows, riding on Caltrain between San Francisco and Silicon Valley, going from work to an event, and they were having a conversation, and they realized through that conversation that as summer interns, they were actually making more than their parents were making. And that realization was incredibly powerful for them to understand how this was going to change the trajectory of their life, how it could change the trajectory of their family and their community. And the important thing, too, is that this isn't just about today. This is about the future. So half the jobs in the top quartile by salary right now require some type of coding or technical skills. We are living through the next rebirth of our economy. And what today may seem niche, the sort of tech industry thing that happens over in the valley, is increasingly permeating the country, the in different industries, and the economy as a whole. Essentially, being shut out of tech today is being shut out of the economy tomorrow. As the Reverend Jesse Jackson put it, this diversity in tech is the next step in the civil rights movement. This is the economic equity piece of the fight for civil rights today. Which brings me to Code 2040's bold goal, our vision for the year 2040, which is that blacks and Latinxes are recognized and valued as powerful innovators. We are leading beneficiaries to, uh, benefactors to and beneficiaries of the innovation economy, and we have the economic and social capital we need to thrive and to build generational wealth. Which is a vision of the world that only comes true if we pull every lever that we know how to end the racism, the structural racism and bias that infiltrates our economy. And we believe that this is totally possible in the next 25 years. And we look forward to living in that world. Thank you.